Hello, everyone, and welcome to the VMC Animal Health Education Series. My name is Lauren Kraft, and I'll be your host this evening as we welcome leaders in veterinary medicine who are here to share their expertise in areas ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also asked for pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during the final portion of the program. Please note that if your question for tonight's presentation relates to your pet's specific medical care, it is best to call the VMC directly or to have your primary care veterinarian contact our team for a consultation so that we can best serve your family. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Eva Furrow. Dr. Furrow is a member of the Lewis Small Animal Hospital's Small Animal Internal Medicine Service, the co-director of the Minnesota Urolist Center, and a leader in our canine genetics lab. Dr. Furrow's primary clinical interest areas include urinary, endocrine, and metabolic disorders, while her research interests are focused on identifying ways to better prevent and treat inherited diseases. We're grateful to have Dr. Furrow with us tonight to discuss how she's applying advanced genetic technologies to uncover causes of urinary stone formation and how that information is then tailored to an individual patient's medical care. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Furrow. Thank you, Lauren. All right. So I'm talking about urinary stone disease today. I want to mention before I get started um, that I have some nerve damage to my vocal cords. So sometimes my voice gives out suddenly or I have a little coughing fit. If that happens, um, don't panic. I will just mute myself for a second and disappear and I promise I'll come back before too long. So who am I? Um, as introduced, I'm one of the small animal internists at the VMC, and I'm also the co-director of the Minnesota Urolist Center. So I'm going to be talking today, the first part of my talk, most of the talk is on dogs, but at the end I have a section that's on some of our new research in cats as well. So in 2020, even with hibernation and being shut, shut down for a period of time, the Minnesota Urolist Center received more than 60,000 urinary stones from dogs. Um, and just so you know, for those of you who are not familiar, the term urolith means urinary stone. So that's just our medical term for urinary stone. So stones are a big problem in veterinary medicine, a big problem for our pet dogs and pet cats. And a little bit of background on what they actually are if you haven't, if you've been lucky and haven't had a pet who have had these, um, when I say stone, I'm talking about an actual solid mass. So the urine is filled with different substances and normally they are all dissolved in solution, but what can happen is that some of them can start to precipitate and form crystals. The crystals themselves are not necessarily a problem, but if they cluster together and grow, they can form a stone. So I've got some images here where you can see microscopic crystals, but then what an actual stone looks like when it forms. Um, so there are several different stone types and each has its own set of causes and unique management recommendations. Our Minnesota Urolist Center, we have all these different guidelines that we give to veterinarians that talk about some of these things, but today I'm focusing specifically on calcium oxalate stones. So the reason why is because that's one of our most common stone types. Um, so most stones in dogs are either made of struvite or calcium oxalate, and that's that red part of the pie here. So calcium oxalate stones, I mean, your, urinary stones in general can be very painful. We see dogs presenting with um, accidents in the house, urgency, suddenly needing to go out, straining with their urinating, urinating more frequently, and here in Minnesota at this time of year, we have a lot of dogs who come in because the owners can see blood in their urine. So the snow makes that more obvious. Um, this image, this is an x-ray of a dog where on the right-hand side, it's the pelvis and the hind legs. Um, this is the tail back here. Down here, this is actually the bone and the penis, the os penis, this is a male dog. And you can see right in the middle here, there are these two really bright looking oval structures. 
and those are bladder stones. But what might not be obvious is that this dog has many stones. So not just those two big ones, but there are a number of smaller ones as well. And this dog has a problem that um, male dogs and cats are more inclined to get, which is that the stones have become uh, blocked where they got stuck in the urethra and therefore this dog was dribbling urine and having difficulty emptying his bladder. So that's an emergency situation. So one of the reasons why I'm talking about calcium oxalate stones is that they are arguably one of our most frustrating urinary stone types because one in two dogs has a recurrence within about two to three years. I have schnauzers on here because they maybe have faster recurrence rates than some of the other breeds. And this is even with us attempting to do things to prevent the stones from reforming. Uh, in terms of what causes calcium oxalate stones, we know that there's a hereditary component. And we know that because we see really striking breed predispositions and breeds are basically large extended families. So when we see that one breed is having a problem much more commonly than the general dog population or other breeds, it suggests that there's something inherited going on. So I have some of the um, predisposed breeds on this slide. Uh, schnauzers, miniature schnauzers, the Bichon Frise, uh, Shih Tzus and Yorkies and Lhasas, Pomeranians, poodles of all sizes, um, Maltese, and there are several others as well, but these are some of the high risk breeds. So we also know that they're hereditary because even when you look within a breed, we see that stones run in families. So these are um, pedigrees. I know a lot of people probably aren't familiar with looking at them, um, but the red, each circle or square is an individual dog and the red are stone formers. Um, and so as you follow down, the ones that are on the same line, those are siblings um, and then their parents are above them. So this just shows that there are a bunch of, in this case, is a bunch of families where multiple siblings were stone formers or where the parents and the offspring were stone formers. So one of the other things we know about calcium oxalate stones is that most of the time, the problem seems to be calcium. So these animals, not only dogs, but also cats and humans that form calcium oxalate stones, most of the time, most of those patients have higher urinary calcium excretion than other animals. Um, so it's less of an oxalate problem, more of a calcium issue. But even though we know that there's a genetic component, we know that that affects urinary calcium and stone risk, we don't really know what these genetic mechanisms are. Um, so a lot, a lot of times we use the term idiopathic when we're talking about calcium oxalate stones, which just means that we don't know why they're forming. And I think that this is a big part of why we can't prevent them from recurring, because if we don't understand why they're happening, it makes it difficult to come up with a solution. So that brings me to the other half of who I am. So I'm a veterinary geneticist and I'm a member of the university's canine genetics lab. And the goal of my research is to discover some of those genetic risk factors so that I can then apply that to advancing veterinary care. So that's kind of the concept behind if you've heard of precision medicine or individualized medicine, it's that with an individual patient, you use their genetic information and genetic background to decide what treatments are best for that person or that animal. So in dogs, you know, there's an advantage of genetic research compared to humans, which is that within a breed, again, they're like large extended families. And so there's less overall genetic diversity within a breed, which means that you kind of have less background noise if you're trying to compare dogs to figure out what's causing stones versus um, a non-stone former. So it, it helps us, this, this inbreeding in individual dogs can actually be really beneficial when you're trying to make genetic discoveries. Um, my primary focus for years has been on what I would call the typical calcium oxalate dog. So by that, I mean, most of the dogs who have been coming in for my study and participating are middle-aged dogs that belong to those high-risk breeds that I mentioned. 
So here are some photos of um, some of the dogs that have come in for my studies. And um, what I've found so far in these dogs is that the cause of stones is complex, meaning that there are multiple genetic risk factors and they interact with each other and also with diet and environment to create risk. So I kind of envision that there are all these different things and that in an individual stone former, which here are the stars on this slide, they're dogs where they happen to have multiple different risk factors, a combination of some genetics, maybe diet, they made them form stones. But what you'll see is that with each of those stars, they don't all have the same problem. So there's some overlapping things that are causing their problem, but it's not all the same. Um, because of this, it's made things a very um, slow process to tease this out, identify these genetic risk factors, and make certain that they really are contributing to stone formation. And this is something that I am continuing to work on. But while chipping away at that, I decided that I was going to look from another angle. So I was going to continue that stone research, but also start another um, direction with my stone research. And that is the atypical calcium oxalate dog. So this is Henry. He is a two-year-old male neutered English bulldog with calcium oxalate stones. And he's atypical for two reasons. So the first thing about him is that he's young. He's younger than a calcium oxalate dog usually is. So this is data from our stone center. This is for um, more than 140,000 dogs. And what you can see is like ages along the X axis. And we have that like big peak right in middle age. So it's, you know, seven to 13 year old dogs. That is most of our dogs that form calcium oxalate stones are in that group. That's actually true of humans too. You usually form kidney stones when you're middle aged. Um, so the young dogs that are two or less, that's less than 1% of our stones. So um, Henry really is young. He's unusually young. The other thing that's weird about him is that English bulldogs are not our typical calcium oxalate stone formers. They weren't on the slide that I showed you of who forms, who's predisposed to calcium oxalate stones. So if you look over at all at all the stones coming in, they're a very tiny portion of our stones. However, if you look just at the dogs who are really young when they're forming stones, bulldogs start showing up and they're much more common than other breeds in that young population. And so what that tells us when we see something where it's happening with this pattern at a young age, but otherwise not common overall, it suggests that it's a single gene problem meaning that it is something where that gene alone is enough to cause the disease, even without all those other layers necessarily. Um, but in this case, it's not a common problem in the breed. So most bulldogs shouldn't have it, but if they do, they're young stone formers. So the nice thing about that is that it's easier to find the cause when it's just one gene. Um, and so the approach that we took was something called whole genome sequencing. So that means we got all the genetic information, the entire genome, we're talking, you know, almost 3 billion base pairs per dog um, of three English bulldogs with calcium oxalate stones. And we go through all that data and say, what's different about them from the kind of published, just what normal dog DNA looks like. And there were more than 4 million different variants, which variants is just another term for mutation. So that's an enormous amount of data and trying to sift through that. I mean, that doesn't sound any easier from what I told you before, trying to figure out which of those is actually causing stones. Um, but we have a whole process for it. And there are steps that you can take, for example, I'm looking for something that's not common in the general dog population and not common in most English bulldogs, just those that form stones. So I can filter out variants that are common in all dogs. Um, I can also filter out variants that I think are 
benign, meaning that they don't even affect a gene, they're in between genes, um, or they're in the gene, but they don't actually change the protein sequence. So we have this series of filtering steps. And I went through them one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, got to the last step. And I only have one variant left. So starting with four, more than 4 million, I ended up with a single variant, which honestly made my blood pressure go up. And I was worried that that meant I had overfiltered um, and been too stringent in my criteria. But when I pulled up this variant to see what it was, I discovered that it was in um, uromodulin. So uromodulin, um, the, the protein made by that gene, it's only in the kidney. So it's made by the kidney and only the kidney. And it, it's the most abundant protein that's secreted in the urine. So it's a very important protein for urinary health. It has a number of functions in the urine, but two of the things it does are related to stones. So it actually inhibits crystallization. It's a crystallization inhibitor and it reduces urinary calcium excretion. So both of those things are really important for preventing stone formation. So this mutation that we found, another interesting thing about it is that it doesn't make the protein disappear completely. Instead, it changes it at a location where we think what one of the theories is, is that it's affecting the polymerization. So what I mean by that is that each little individual protein, uromodulin protein is made, but then when it gets released into the urine, they bind to each other and they make these like long intricate filaments in the urine. And so this mutation might be blocking that filament formation. So that means we think it's, it's less about how much uromodulin is in the urine and more about um, how that uromodulin is functioning and what it's doing, how it's building and forming these units. So I'm gonna come back to this. Um, I'm gonna first tell you a little bit more about this mutation and who we found it in. So it turns out that um, two out of three English bulldogs with calcium oxalate stones are affected by the mutation. So we have kind of solved two thirds of calcium oxalate stone formers in this breed. These are again, they're young dogs. So the median age at which they form stones is two in dogs with this mutation. And this is way more common. So two out of three is way more common than how common this mutation is in the general bulldog population. Um, so in just random bulldogs, if you just test them for the mutation and they haven't had stones before, it's in about 1%. That's actually probably an overestimate because the single dog that we found it in um, was a very young female dog. And so she was kind of too young to know whether or not she's gonna go on to form stones or to say that she's not gonna go on to form stones. Um, overall, the mutation is very rare in dogs. So we checked genome databases, over 3000 dogs. No dogs had two copies and you need two copies to form stones. Um, we did find one copy in an American Staffordshire Terrier. So we know that that breed can have the mutation. But then what we decided to do is specifically recruit dogs where they were sending in calcium oxalate stones to the Uralis Center. Um, and when we did that, we did find the mutation in many more dogs. So again, like in the general dog population, it's not that common, but if you're looking specifically at calcium oxalate stone formers, it starts to show up more. So in addition to the bulldog, it's in the Boston Terrier, the American Staffordshire Terrier, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, Bull Mastiff, Rottweiler, Havanese, Border Collie. Um, and it very well may be in more breeds, but I have this like rainbow plot up here. I know you can't read the text, um, but what this is, is this is showing relationships between different breeds. So each color of cluster are related breeds. And most of the breeds that have the uromodulin mutation all fall together in one cluster. So they're related to each other. Um, they're in what's called the Mastiff lineage. So that's where bulldogs and mastiffs are. So there likely are going to be other dogs in this group where we'll find the mutation too. We just haven't screened enough dogs yet. Um, 
Surprisingly, the mutation is in a couple less related breeds. So the Havanese and the Border Collie are not part of that other group. But I was very sad that this mutation does not explain any of the miniature schnauzers, Pashans, Shih Tzus, Yorkies, or other really high-risk breeds um, that I've been working on studying for so long. So we still have to solve those, um, but this is progress. So just knowing this, how can I apply this information to the patient? So what can I do differently for Henry knowing this information? Well, um, there are different prescription urinary diets out there to form calcium oxalate stones. And there's a lot of properties that they have in common with each other. But one of the things that can differ between the diets is the salt content. Because some of the diets actually are low in salt and others are high in salt. And in Henry's case, um, it's important that he has a low salt diet because there's data from people and from rodent models saying that um, high salt can affect the function of uromodulin and that it might not be excreted as much um, or might not work as well. And so we definitely don't want to take his protein that's already not working very well and make it worse. So that's something, you know, I can guess at right now, just based on his genetic information. Um, I also know there's a supplement that we give to a lot of dogs with calcium oxalate stones. It's called potassium citrate. And usually our recommendation is if the urine pH is low, we give this. Well, in this case, I would say, even if his urine pH is fine, he should be on potassium citrate for life because citrate can make uromodulin work better. So the two of them together have this positive effect on preventing stones. So maybe citrate can help him regain some function of his uromodulin. Um, and then the last thing is that this is another drug that we're already using, but there's a medication called hydrochlorothiazide. And what happens is that this medication helps you um, resorb urine, so uh, resorb calcium, so hold calcium back in your body, keep, keep you from excreting too much of it. And it does it in a part of the kidney before you get to the part where your modulin works, which means that you can resorb some of the calcium early on and that way there's less for uromodulin to mess up and make you excrete. And so that's another thing that is potentially very helpful and important for Henry. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with what we know so far, but one of my big hopes and goals is that this is going to lead to new discoveries. So there are drugs out there that actually affect your modulin polymerization. They're not ones that we routinely use for stone formation. Um, but it's very possible that if those drugs, if we can um, recapture the polymerization, correct that defect with these drugs, we might be able to reduce stone risk in these dogs. So these images here, these are just showing the uromodulin filaments again and how they bind. So my hope is that now that we know what's wrong, we can start thinking about ways to correct it. So we can fix that defect in this protein. Again, it's, it's about the quality, not the quantity, and try to bring it back to, to normal function. So um, what is interesting is that in human calcium oxalate store informers, they know that uromodulin also malfunctions, but they don't know why. So what I mean by that is that the amount of uromodulin in the urine of human calcium oxalate stone formers is, you know, it fluctuates, but it seems like it's not really different from people without stones. Um, and yet, if you take uromodulin out of the urine of a human stone former, and you look at it like in a laboratory setting, rather than preventing stone formation, it increases stone formation, it increases crystallization. So there's some sort of flip here where uromodulin has gone from protecting to causing stones. And so now we have a theory for what that might be. We have a theory that maybe it's the polymerization that makes the difference between it functioning as a stone inhibitor versus a promoter. Um, 
So maybe this research on the bulldog mutation is not only going to help bulldogs, but it could help human stone formers too, since we know that something is going on with uromodulin. So um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but um, I love some of the human kidney stone trivia. So I'll just tell people that um, kidney stones are very common. I'm sure there are people listening to this talk right now who have already had them. There's more than a 10% lifetime incidence. So these are some of the famous kidney stone formers. Um, and just looking at this slide, you know, you'll notice that Sir Isaac Newton, Alfred Hitchcock, you know, Kiefer Sutherland, most of these are men. So men are at greater risk. And that's something I didn't mention before, but with calcium oxalate stones, um, male dogs are at higher risk than females. So um, in humans, like in dogs, these stones are highly recurrent. They don't have great ways to prevent them. So they see about a 50% recurrence rate in five years versus the two to three that we see in dogs. Um, and they are hereditary in people too. So the biggest risk factor for you forming a stone is having a family member with stones. So one of the reasons why this matters is because um, the University of Minnesota, we are part of a One Health Alliance between different schools um, where we try to do research that really has that benefit and this recognition of ways that we can help multiple species. Um, and because of this and the potential for, you know, helping dogs to also help humans, I have some collaborators on the human side. So um, Dr. John Liskey at Mayo Clinic, he's a nephrologist who's been my collaborator for years. And then more recently, when I made the uromodulin discovery, I started working with Dr. Luca Rampoldi, um, who's in Italy, but his whole focus and career is devoted to uromodulin. Um, so it's exciting that I have access to these um, brilliant researchers and other laboratories where together they can help me understand what's happening in the dog and how to help the dog. And then that might give them ideas for how to help humans. Okay, so I've told you two out of three bulldogs with calcium oxalate stones are homozygous for the mutation. That's awesome. We've solved a lot of them. But what about that third dog who doesn't have uromodulin? Well, um, meet another atypical calcium oxalate dog. This is Bacon. He was also two when he formed stones, an elder male neutered dog but he was clear of the uromodulin mutation. So I decided why not do it all over again? Do the whole genome sequencing, three English bulldogs again, but this time only the ones that did not have the uromodulin mutation. So I am trying to solve that final third. Again, more than 4 million variants to start, filtered, and there was one left at the end. This time, um, it was in a protein called NKCC2. It's also made by the kidney and only the kidney. Um, it reduces urinary calcium excretion as well. It has um, a slightly different mechanism by which it does it, but it also is related to that urine calcium. So um, in humans, mutations in this gene called, cause something called barter syndrome. Um, I think this is interesting, but in Barter syndrome, this mutation is associated with large eyes, large ears, and a drooping mouth. I don't know if that's a coincidence or whether or not that means some of these bulldogs who had this mutation looked adorable and were bred because of it. And that's part of how that mutation became common in the breed. So how do I apply this to bacon and how does it look different from what I told you before about Henry? Well, with salt, this time salt is actually good. This mutation usually causes salt loss in the urine. So they actually um, often need salt to help regulate their body and be normal. In addition to that, um, he needs potassium, but actually rather than potassium citrate, potassium chloride might be a more appropriate supplement. It's not one we routinely use. It definitely doesn't taste as good. Um, but for him, it might be the better way to prevent stones. And then with hydrochlorothiazide, even though his defect is also in um, calcium excretion and the kidney, 
we don't want to give that medication because his defect puts him at high risk of dehydration and the combination of his defect plus hydrochlorothiazide could make that worse. So it's actually a very different management plan from Henry. Okay, so that's where we're at. I've solved most of these bulldogs. Um, I really want to figure out these high risk breeds now. And so what I'm doing is in addition to doing all my analyses on those middle-aged dogs, I'm also now specifically trying to recruit and pull out the dogs that have unusually severe disease. So our youngest, most recurrent stone formers. So I have some dogs where they've had stones, you know, four, five, six times. Um, and again, you know, young dogs where they're one, two, three, four years of age when they formed stones. Um, so that's kind of my dog section. And the take home point that I want you guys to get is that discoveries of genetic risk factors for stones that we can then apply them to the individual patient. And the hope is that it will allow us one to best use the resources that are currently out there for stone prevention, but that it's also going to give us new ideas for how to invent novel therapies. So we really need new treatments to prevent stones in dogs and in humans. We need completely different ideas. And hopefully this is going to be part of how we get there. Okay. So part two is cats. Um, cats, we don't see as many stone submissions overall from them, but we got 18,000 in 2020. Um, and calcium oxalate stones are also really common in cats. So very similar breakdown to what we see in dogs. Um, but one of the most frustrating problems in cats is that in addition to forming stones, you know, in their bladder that cause all the signs I talked about before in dogs, they also, they're kind of like humans and that they got a lot more stones. They get stuck between their kidneys and their bladder. So they get lodged in something called the ureter. So that's the tube that runs from the kidney to the bladder. And that can be extremely painful and extremely damaging to the kidney. And when you look just at those stones that block the ureters, 98% of them are calcium oxalate. So this is usually a calcium oxalate problem. So I mentioned, you know, when that obstruction happens, kidney function is rapidly lost, um, which means that you really need to treat it immediately. And I have an image, this is an ultrasound of a normal kidney. It probably looks like nothing to most of you. What you're looking at is that this outline is the kidney. There's normal tissue that's from, you know, the outline inwards. And then the black space in here, that's where the urine is forming. So what happens is that this is an obstructed kidney that got blocked. The urine backed up, it formed, it's like a balloon here. And then it's compressing and smushing all that normal tissue. So it's causing all this damage from that pressure buildup um, to the normal kidney tissue. So the current recommendation is to treat these by surgically placing an artificial ureter. So we actually place a tube into the kidney, have it run, we actually have it run through the body and then up under the skin, because then we can have a little port where we can flush it if it gets um, a little bit blocked. And then the other end runs to the bladder so that the urine flows from the kidney through this tube to the bladder and it, the cat stays obstructed. So sorry, I didn't show this well in the first x-ray. Let me just go back for a second. In this cat, this is the kidney up here and there's a stone in it here, but this is the one that's blocking the ureter. It's this little guy here. So you can see after surgery, he still has the stone in here. We didn't take it out. We just placed an artificial system to, to bypass it. Um, so that's great, except for it is very expensive to place these devices. And they do great in the short term, but there is a high frequency of long-term complications um, that can be very frustrating. So we see a lot of these artificial ureters get blocked with stones over time. So just like the normal ureter gets blocked, the artificial one does too. So this is a picture where it got blocked, they took it out, and inside of it, they found many calcium oxalate stones. Okay, so thinking creatively, how do we solve this? 
Well, um, I learned a few years ago that astronauts are high risk for forming kidney stones because of bone demineralization and dehydration that can happen during space flight. And because of that, um, NASA actually funds some kidney stone research because they are trying to develop a device that can go to space with the astronauts so that they can treat their own stones if they happen while in space and they don't have this emergency situation um, when they're way too far away to have anyone manage it. Um, so a few years ago um, at a stone meeting, I met Dr. Mike Bailey, who is an engineer at the University of Washington, and he's funded by NASA and by NIH. And he was working on this device. And it's a new form of extracorporeal lithotripsy. What I mean by that is that it is a device um, that uses sound waves from outside the body. Um, it's directed with an ultrasound machine and it breaks up stones. And so if you've heard of shockwave lithotripsy before, this is called burst wave lithotripsy. So burst wave lithotripsy, the concept is that it uses much lower pressure, but much higher frequency waves. The reason why this is relevant is because it's really very different from shockwave lithotripsy and shockwave lithotripsy does not work in cat stones. It really will not break them up. It's very ineffective and we can't use it in cats. So in people, they do it all the time, um, but in cats, it's really not an option for us. Um, and burst wave laser tripsy is cool because with this change in how the pressure and frequency goes, it means that the stone fragments, rather than going into like big chunks one at a time, it actually like more powders it into small pieces. Um, and so that means that there's less bouncing around and potentially less damage from big sharp pieces. Um, and again, it's just a different system. So I said to Dr. Bealey, like, we have this problem in cats. Is there any way you can do this for cats? And he said, well, sure, send me some CT scans and I'll do some modeling and get a sense of if we could do it. Um, so this was them kind of modeling, okay, where are the kidneys in a cat? Where are the ureters? What organs do we want to avoid? And this was them then figuring out, okay, based on where the kidneys and ureters are, you know, the red spots are where would we want to direct these waves to break up stones. And this is our cat system. So they built us a cat system. We have an ultrasound machine. We have this little energy box that controls the um, lithotripsy waves. Um, and then we have the end part, which has the ultrasound probe on it. And then it's got this little delivery advice device, and it's got a little pocket of water in it covered by a little diaphragm that just presses gently up against the cat's body. Um, so this is it in another view. And this is a diagram kind of showing the concept of it'll be against the cat's body wall. And then it's, we'll target the stone. So we have a sense of where we want the stone to be relative um, to the probe in order to get the best effect. So we've tested this before testing it out in cats. We tested it out just in cat stones because we were like calcium oxalate stones in cats, they don't break up with shockwave. Well, this is a stone after 10 minutes of burst wave lithotripsy. So it's actually highly effective for calcium oxalate stones in cats. Um, this, so this was all done just in a water bath, not with a cat, with stones that had been surgically removed from cats um, because they'd been sent into the stone center from their veterinarian. So this works very well um, in initial testing. And we now have funding from the Every Cat Health Foundation. We're actually about to open a clinical trial. Um, we're gonna start with cats that you know come in where they're really looking at their only option is placing that artificial ureter. And now we have an alternative option to them, for them where the clinical trial will cover everything and it will hopefully give them this way to treat the stone and remove the obstruction without needing surgery and without having all those long-term risks. So that's the conclusion of part two is that it's really cool working with on the human medicine side, like in this case that they have this new technology in humans, they're doing the clinical trials in humans right now. 
there are only a couple of these devices out there in the world and they made us one for cats. So we have the only cat system. Um, what is extra cool about this is that we have the only cat system now, but if this works, they can make them for veterinarians everywhere. And it can be done by some, anybody who can has ultrasound skills. So any ultrasonographer, which means that it might become really widely available as an option um, and far more affordable than the current surgical options. So it would just be amazing if there's this way to more rapidly and less expensively and more accessibly and safely treat these stones. So um, I have acknowledgements. Um, the Minnesota Urla Center, all of their staff are incredible. They've been very helpful to help me look at data, identify study participants, share news of my studies. Dr. Jody Lulich is the co-director um, and he's a been a big collaborator with me in all of my work. Um, in the canine genetics lab, my lab manager is Katie Miner and she is brilliant and has also been very important in some of these discoveries. And I've had um, funding over the years from the Morris Animal Foundation, the AKC Canine Health Foundation, um, like I said, the Every Cat Health Foundation. We actually already have funding from the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, which said that if all goes well with the pilot study, they will fund us treating more cats with burst wave. Um, if we have problems, they'll fund us troubleshooting and fixing the device so that we can hopefully get it working. Um, I have some NIH funding. And then I want to thank all the dog and cat study participants and their owners, because I wouldn't be able to make any of these discoveries and help improve the health of many animals without those people that have been willing to participate in this research. So I will stop there and let Lauren take over with questions. All right, thank you so much. That was um, great. Certainly learned a lot about all the work you're doing with your colleagues. So we did have a, a lot of questions come in in advance and some tonight, so we can dive right in. Um, the first one is related to diagnosing stones. And so um, someone asked, is it possible to diagnose stones before they form? So are there any things that um, people can look for in advance? At this stage, it's really hard. So in English bulldogs, I would say, yes, if we test for those genetic mutations and find them, we can identify that those dogs are high risk for forming stones. So it's not that, um, we're diagnosing the stone itself, but we're diagnosing kind of the, this genetic defect that puts them at risk. The other things that we can do kind of for everyone is we certainly can measure urine calcium excretion in the urine. However, we found that there are a lot of dogs that have high calcium that don't go on to form stones. So it's not very predictable. Um, some of the other things that's more helpful for other stone types, less helpful for calcium oxalate is looking at crystals in the urine. So calcium oxalate crystals are actually, can be normal in healthy dogs, but there are some crystals like urate or cysteine, where if we see those crystals, they're kind of an early sign that the dog might be at risk for stones. Um, so I would say in some ways we can do it. Most of the time we don't know a dog is going to be a stone former until they've already done it. Okay. Um, there were a lot of questions about diet. So this person asked how important is diet in preventing and controlling urinary stone formation? Um, and how effective are prescription like kidney food diets, um, for preventing stones. Then there's kind of a follow-up to that is, are there other ways to prevent or decrease the likelihood of a dog developing urinary stones outside of diet too? Yeah, those are good questions. So how important is diet? Um, there isn't enough data in veterinary medicine for me to give like an estimate of how much diet contributes. I suspect it probably varies a lot dog to dog and matters much more for some than others. I know that in human medicine, uh, nutritionists who deal with kidney stone formers talk about how, you know, there are general guidelines out there for what to do with diet to prevent stone formation, but it really is the individual. So some patients come in for example, my mother is a kidney stone former, um, and in her diet history, 
you'll discover that she eats an enormous amount of spinach and other green leafy vegetables. She has this big garden in her backyard and it's like spinach salads every single night. Spinach is one of the highest oxalate foods. She also eats beet greens, which I feel like nobody does except for her. And that's also really high oxalate. So for her diet was clearly very important for why she formed stones. She had high oxalate in her urine. She had this dietary history. Um, but there are other people where diet probably makes very little difference that really it's genetics are the big thing. They might be on a diet that really is not a problem. It's just that everything else, you know, those other risk factors are contributing. Um, so how effective are our prescription diets? I look at it in part as like, there are all these diets out there where we have no idea how they affect risk. When you move to a prescription food, you know that you're kind of eliminating or reducing the dietary risks as much as possible. Um, again, in some dogs, it might not be enough to stop them from reforming stones. Um, but in others, it might just push them right below the threshold where then it does make a difference. Um, but we don't have good data to say again, how common that is and how much their risk goes down on the diet. Um, let's see, what else did you ask? How do you how else do you prevent it? Yeah, if there are other ways to prevent or decrease the likelihood. Sure. So um, this is not at all inventive, but it is one of the most important ways to prevent stones across all stone types and across all species, and that is encouraging water intake. So that's actually in human medicine, it is like the most effective way to reduce your risk of recurrence is to drink more water. Um, in dogs and cats, we usually say to do this by feeding a canned diet, adding water to the dry food to the point where it's like floating even more than cereal um, or low sodium broth to the dog food, um, but really trying to encourage them to drink more. Great. Um, okay, next question. We had a few people who asked about dogs who have been diagnosed with urinary stones, and they're wondering if there are ways to chemically dissolve the stones. So for the type that I talked about, one of the reasons why I'm so focused on it is because there really aren't. So we don't have a way like in that animal to dissolve their stone. Um, Dr. Lulich is working on some ways to dissolve them in a laboratory setting. So he's playing with different things to see if he can get them dissolving in a laboratory setting. Is there some way to then move that back to in the actual patient? So maybe in the future, but for calcium oxalate, not yet. Um, however, the stone type that I didn't talk about, the other most common one, which is struvite, is very dissolvable. So in dogs, struvite stones, they form secondary to urinary tract infections. And if the stone is pure struvite, um, we can dissolve them in a month or two using a combination of antibiotics to treat the infection and one of the prescription urinary diets. In cats, they're not related to urinary tract infection and they dissolve even faster. So you put them on a prescription diet and they can dissolve within a couple of weeks. So those are kind of the top two and so completely different answers for struvite and calcium oxalate. Um, there are some rare stone types that can dissolve a little bit less reliably with diet and medication, um, but they're rare and a little bit different. Okay, I actually have a follow up to that because we did get a question about struvite stones tonight. So one person was wondering that if you raise the pH of urine, are you concerned about struvite stone, stones forming? Yeah, so the answer depends on whether you're a dog or a cat. So in dogs, just having a high urine pH by itself doesn't seem to be enough to make them a struvite stone former. It has to be that they also have really high concentrations of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate, which are the components of struvite stones. So that's why um, certain bacteria result in production of some of those things. So the combination of, it's usually again, bacteria, the bacteria also raise the urine pH, but even on diets that raise the urine pH, we won't see struvite stones unless there's an infection. In cats, probably yes, if you push the urine pH too high, they might flip from being a calcium oxalate stone former to a struvite stone former. And so in cats, a lot of the diets are really meant to be like very strictly at what we call like a neutral or, or urine pH. Um, 
And what was I going to say? Yeah. And we also less commonly put cats on medications to raise their urine pH, because again, we, we want to be careful. We don't push them too far. So for dogs, it's not a problem for cats. We do worry. Okay. Um, next question. Is there any evidence to suggest calcium oxalate stones in dogs can be caused from vitamin supplements or tablets that dogs can take to neutralize their urine? So of course it depends on what's in the supplement. I would say that there isn't data out there yet in dogs to say that there are supplements that are specific supplements that are risk factors, but in humans, vitamin D supplementation is definitely associated with kidney stones. And it seems like it might be because a subset of stone formers have a problem with vitamin D metabolism. And so they tend to hyperactivate it um, or not deactivate it properly. And so it's very easy to have them end up with excessive amounts. Um, we don't know how common that is in dogs and cats. So it's certainly possible that vitamin D specifically, if you supplement it in dogs that are stone formers, some of them, it might make things worse. Um, but we don't have that data yet. So, um, neutralizing the urine, you know, from the calcium oxalate perspective, that's usually a good thing. Um, and the supplement I talked about potassium citrate that we use to kind of drive the urine pH up citrate doesn't just drive the urine pH up. It actually also helps inhibit crystallization and it helps your modulin work better. So it has some beneficial effects beyond just the urine pH. Nice. Thank you. Um, can dogs and cats who have stone history and are on those special diets that we talked about earlier, have the occasional treat, um, without risking more stone formation? Uh, I get this question a lot. So I'll start with kind of a blanket recommendation that, um, unless you're working with a veterinary nutritionist, we usually say, make sure any treats you're giving are less than 10% of the calories that your dog gets. So just be aware that you're not overdoing it with the treats. Um, when you're in that range, probably a lot of things are okay. There are some things that we specifically say to avoid and it depends on what the stone type is. So for calcium oxalate, I usually say no peanut butter. So even though high urinary calcium is the problem they, they have from like the genetic side, the dietary side that often contributes is oxalate. Um, or at least that's what we worry about that oxalate from the diet, it combines with that high urinary calcium and we see stones. So peanut butter is high in oxalate, sweet potatoes are, apples are, um, carrots can be, it actually depends on where they're grown and how they're prepared. But those are things we kind of avoid. And on the Euralist Center, we actually have a little tab that says human foods, and you can find some links to tables on, you know, high oxalate foods that you might want to limit. Um, versus ones that are lower in oxalate. So um, most meats are not a big problem for calcium oxalate stone formers. Again, as long as you're for not feeding too much of it, because a lot of meat can acidify the urine, um, but it depends. So like bologna might be a problem. Chicken is not. Um, seafood might be a problem. So there are some that are maybe higher risk. Um, Cheese is usually okay for calcium oxalate stone formers in moderation. But with any of this, like I, I recommend talking to your veterinarian just to check on the list of treats that you commonly give, make sure it's okay. Um, there are some treats that might even be beneficial, like bananas might be good for calcium oxalate stone formers. But yeah, for other stone types, the list is completely different. So if you have a dog that forms urate stone, you're gonna urate stones, you're gonna get a different list of ingredients to avoid. Okay. That's good to know that resources out there. I won't say no peanut butter in front of my dog. <laughs> you said it. My dog doesn't like peanut butter. <laughs> He's weird. Um, next question. Can a dog have sediment? And I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but in ammonia by urate crystal rhea without renal and bladder stones. And is the reverse also true? So um, yes and yes. So both of those things are true. Um, so ammonium biurate crystals, they're not something we see in the urine of like healthy dogs. When we see them, they mean that that animal is excreting more uric acid than they should. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to form stones. 
So like more than 90% of Dalmatians secrete more uric acid than other breeds do. And yet most of them don't form stones, but some of them do form urate stones. That's actually the most common stone type we see in the breed because of this high uric acid. Um, so crystals do not mean that stones are there and vice versa. We see lots of dogs who have stones who have no crystals. Um, we also see sneaky ones sometimes. So, um, you know, calcium oxalate and struvite crystals can be in healthy dogs. And sometimes things change between when a stone forms and when you check a urine. So sometimes we get tricked where we see stones in the bladder and then the crystals are like struvite crystals, but the stones in the bladder turn out to be calcium oxalate or vice versa. So sometimes they don't even tell us the composition. Okay. Um, I know we talked about diet and you mentioned salt, but one person's asking what is the most important thing to look at on pet food labels to help avoid urinary stones? And, and I think in particular, they're wondering if there are specific ingredients that they can look for and avoid. So it's really hard. I would say, you know, if you have a dog that has had stones, like something to know is that it's not always about the individual ingredient. It's about kind of the sum of the parts and that can be really hard to predict. And so because of that, that's the reason why I generally recommend like the prescription urinary diets that have been not just formulated, but like they actually tested the effects on the urine and looked at kind of these markers of crystallization and stone formation. So those, I feel pretty comfortable that like, okay, that's a safe diet. Um, with over the counter ones, like who knows? Um, I certainly look at some, so examples of specific ingredients I've mentioned, spinach, sweet potatoes, apples, berries, um, all of those are potentially problematic for calcium oxalate stones but it completely depends on how much is in the diet relative to everything else. So there could be a diet with one of those ingredients on it. That's perfectly fine. But another one, it might be that that's a problem. Um, so it's hard. It's hard to look at an ingredient list and guess. Sure. This is probably related. Um, but do you remember, do you recommend a specific type of water for, for dogs or does it not matter between purified or distilled or the different options? So I don't, there's a lot of research on this on the human end and especially like living in, I don't know if it's all of Minnesota or just where I live, but there's you no know, hard water where I didn't even know what that meant when I lived in Philadelphia. And then I came out here and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> um, but the high mineral content of our water. So there's been a lot of research on water, bottled water, hard water, things like that. And in people, it's overall looks like it probably doesn't make a difference that in general, just whatever water your dog likes the taste of best and enjoys drinking is what you should go with. Um, because some of the effects of the minerals in the water are like the opposite of what you'd expect, where it sounds like it would be bad for a stone former, but actually the overall effect on the urine turns out to be positive for one reason or another. So as of now, I would say any water is good, whatever you enjoy drinking or your dog enjoys drinking or is easy for you. Nice. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it's about the burst wave lithotripsy. So would the burst wave lithotripsy be suitable for addressing calcium oxalate and other stones that are causing urethral partial obstruction, um, that is refractory or retropulsion? So, um, right now, so the way the system was designed, we had to have like all that modeling to figure out, okay, with the device, we need to know how far away the stone is going to be from the body wall. We need to make sure that there are no structures in the way. Um, with urethral stones, there's a lot of bones. So like the pelvis can be in the way. Um, depending on where it is in a dog, there might be a region where you could safely treat it. In a cat, they're so tiny and everything else. I don't know if we'd have a window that we could get to the stone. Um, so right now it's not designed that way. And I don't I'm worried that it's not going to be easy to design it that way. Um, and so in cats, usually we flush the stone into the bladder and then do surgery on the bladder. Um, and in dogs, we can do laser lithotripsy where we go in with a video camera and we directly use a laser that 
we push against the stone to break it up. Um, so yeah, we focused on the stones in the ureter one, because we thought it would work best for them. And two, because they're the ones where we have the most limited options for right now. But, yeah. Great. Well, thank you um, so much, Dr. Furrow, for such a great presentation. Uh, and thank you to our participants that shared such thoughtful questions in advance and during tonight's presentation. Um, if you enjoyed learning about our team's work tonight, we certainly encourage you to visit our website, reach out to us directly to learn more about our mission to improve the health and well being of animals and of people. Um, and we hope you'll consider supporting our canine genetics lab in the Minnesota Urala Center through philanthropy as well. Gifts certainly play a critical role in expanding this work. And we thank everyone who's joining us tonight who supports the Lewis Small Animal Hospital and the work we do here. So we look forward to welcoming you all next month when Dr. Stephanie Goldschmidt will join us to discuss dental health strategies for your pet. And thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you, everybody.